Wonderful. Okay, can you all hear me? Okay, welcome. Um, so the panel that you are all here for is on non-news efforts building large audiences, how we do it and why the news industry should pay attention. Um, if you're here, congratulations on being like real loyalists because I know this is one of the last panels before um, the English session ends. Uh, so we're really delighted to see you. If anyone wants to move closer, we would be loving seeing you even closer um, because it feels like some of you are in the back because you're not quite sure if this is worth it. I promise it will be worth it. Um, yeah, <laughs> and if you leave, oh, thanks, Roger, real uh, optimistic there. If you sit in the front and if you leave, we will not be offended. Um, so, uh, but really, I've been looking forward um, to this discussion um, all, all week, uh, partly because uh, the two people to my left are um, inspirational in my own career. They're people who I've turned to on this very subject of um, how to grow audience and um, sort of what, uh, in a time of um, immense change um, are the ways to do that. So um, I'll just introduce myself quickly and then I'm gonna turn it over to each of them uh, to tell you their roles. My name is Mitra Kalida. I will be the moderator of this panel. I believe in um, moderation, including on my own role here. So um, hopefully you'll hear more from them than from me. Um, but I am the um, CEO and co-founder of two media companies, uh, one is Epic Center NYC, a newsletter launched uh, to get New Yorkers through the pandemic, and uh, URL Media, which stands for Uplift, Respect, and Love, a network of 20 black and brown media organizations in the US that share content, revenue, um, and advertising. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to each of you to introduce uh, your current roles, which as you can tell from the title are non-news roles. Um, and you can Google them, their bios are extensive and impressive, but if you just don't mind listing kind of the journalism credentials that you had before your current gig. Carla, you wanna start? There you go. Hello. Um, I'm, I'm usually a, an incredibly loud person, so um, I, microphone optional. Um, I got my start in journalism about 20 years ago. I started in community journalism in New York City, um, and that's always honestly been my passion. So working for local community papers, um, I started my own hyperlocal blog, um, which then was basically picked up by a news startup called DNA Info in New York City, which then we expanded to Chicago. Um, and that was a hyperlocal site in the uh, late 2000s, early 2010s. From there, I went on to work at the Wall Street Journal um, in a news role focused on audience development and content creation, programming, analytics, et cetera. Um, but I would really say that that was a bridge role, working in a newsroom, but taking some aspects of marketing and understanding of um, some business acumen and really trying to build that into the work that we did at the journal. And then a little bit more than four years ago, I made the change and moved over to um, TED, which I normally have to say TED Talks, but the company is called TED, just so everyone knows. Um, and that role we'll talk quite a bit about, but it, it is really in the vein of what I did at the Wall Street Journal, a blended um, role that takes journalism skills, um, all in, in the focus of building audience, engaging with audience. Um, and I, I guess I, I really haven't spoken about being a journalist in some time. And you know, my, my start when I say that I began in community journalism, that was as a reporter, a, a one woman band doing um, investigative reporting, crime reporting, um, you know, reporting in uh, a city setting, um, basically needing to do everything on my own. And that was an incredibly useful start as a journalist because I got to learn how to do every single thing, you know, the, the story reporting, the thinking about the audience, the engaging with the audience, um, communicating with that audience, um, and that has all served as a foundation to where I am now. 
Hi, uh, Raju Narasati. I'm uh, with McKinsey now, but uh, I've spent about 30 years in media uh, in almost like three different chunks of it. The first uh, 20 or so uh, committing acts of journalism myself. Uh, I was a reporter at the Wall Street Journal and became an editor, ran Wall Street Journal Europe, um, and then also ran digital for the Wall Street Journal. I was the managing editor of the Washington Post uh, for a few years. Um, and then switched to the business side of media companies. I was a senior vice president strategy for News Corp, um, and then was CEO of a company called Gizmodo Media Group, which had The Onion and a bunch of other cool sites. Um, for a few years, I taught at uh, Columbia University Journalism School, uh, where I was reading, uh, leading a business uh, journalism programs. And for the last four years, I've been at McKinsey. So most of my um, journalism career was actually um, in the transition from print to digital and um, an early embracing of the idea that uh, digital is actually where the future is and spending a lot of time thinking about audiences and monetization. Uh, so that has continued in my current role where I also think about audiences and we can talk a little bit about it. And uh, so that's the thing. Can we just stay with you, Raju, because um by the title of the panel, non-news, right? So much of news seems, at least in my case, of trying to build a habit among our readers, viewers, our audiences. I'm wondering, um, do you see your audience as one where you're trying to build a habit, or is it a different relationship um, since it's non-news? And then on, along the same lines, how are you getting people's attention? Before I answer, maybe it'll be helpful to just give a context of what publishing is sure. at McKinsey. So McKinsey um, is actually the creator of this buzzword, thought leadership. They began 58 years ago when they launched uh, McKinsey Quarterly. It's a magazine that they've been publishing uh, since then. And about 20 years ago, they um, switched most of uh, their publishing to the web. Essentially, the belief was that if you have good ideas about business and how to do business and you publish them, that the audiences that are reading them would find it interesting, relevant, and that in turn might lead to a business for McKinsey. So it's not an automatic, like we're not trying to use publishing to get clients, but the belief is that if you actually have good ideas, the clients will come. So the focus is very clearly on business content, but the difference between, I would say, news and our kind of thinking is we call it the insights to impact. So everything actually is news you can use in a business context, well before solutions journalism and impact of journalism and all started getting talked about. We, McKinsey has been doing it for a long time. And it is habit forming in the sense that if, you, if somebody reads an article and says, okay, you know, I'm having the same problem and I think this applies to me, you build enough of a engagement that they will then, the next time they're having a problem, they'll say, let me see what McKinsey has about it. So that's been the basis of building um, a repeat audience, if you will. Uh, but the, some of the techniques that all of us use to kind of remind people that you have content, um, you know, make sure it drops in front of them in the middle of all the other things they're looking at, all those are relatively the same. So I think you know this, but I actually um, discovered, got a little late maybe to the game, but I discovered McKinsey publishing content through much of the pandemic because as I was, I, I, I just told you I'm a media entrepreneur. Um, and so as I was making that transition, I would find myself searching for different content around small businesses just to see if I was doing it right. And I was surprised how much McKinsey surfaced versus say, um, you know, Harvard Business Review or kind of some of the other Inc. magazines, some of the other places. Is that how most people are finding you or is, was I doing it the right way? Yeah, search brings about 54% of our audience. Okay. Okay. Uh, a fairly large email program reminds you of like the content that we might have on a regular basis, but that's the majority of it. Okay. Carla, this question of habit and um, who, who your people are, how do they find you? Yeah, so search is certainly a big part of it. Um, but it's exactly the same way that any newsroom, any modern newsroom is finding its audience at this time. So you really have um, a broad distribution uh, strategy that we follow. Some of that has to do with social media, some of that is newsletters, 
Um, the web is still, you know, TED.com is still a place where people come and are looking for content. I'll come back to uh, their behavior on that site, which is actually quite interesting. And then YouTube is the biggest driver of engagement for us. Um, and habit, loyalty, really building like a healthy habit is central to everything that we do. So, you know, TED's content is, um, so first of all, TED stands for um, Tech, Entertainment, and Design. Most people don't know that. Um, often, I think that entertainment should be, um, could be interplayed with education. Um, that is how we're categorized quite often um, in, on lots of different platforms. But at the end of the day, that word entertainment is really important. Because the thing that we're trying to do by trying to build a healthy habit, we believe that any piece of content needs to really be entertaining in nature. So if it's a, a talk, how is that person providing a story? You know, is this about science? Is it about tech? Is it about something? You know, are we talking about like uh, biology to an audience that otherwise wouldn't be interested in this. How do you really bring a story to that audience and how do you make it engaging? Um, so there's obviously, you know, the TED Talk has become a little bit of a meme because it has a formula, it has a way, a cadence of telling stories. We're working to really evolve that, but it works. It works because we can actually see that people, when they engage with our talks, they're sticking around and they're they're consuming lots of minutes of someone speaking on stage about topics that they may have otherwise not even known that they wanted to know something about it. Um, so we take a lot, we see a lot of value in that. Um, but the, the point I wanted to make about the difference between say YouTube or social media versus our newsletters and TED.com is that the user behavior difference that I see there is one on social media and on YouTube, um, you know, obviously there's been much discussed this, this weekend um, about the discovery mechanism and how somebody actually finds that content, it's, it's really up to the algorithm that's going to drive that content to you. So it's a little bit of happenstance. Um, when it comes to TED.com or newsletters, the audience is really not just looking for the actual content of the talks, but they are looking for curation. They're looking because they trust that TED is going to curate an experience for them. We're going to put pieces that are similar, that we're going to understand what the audience is looking for, and we're going to kind of guide you through an experience. Um, we find that when somebody comes onto the website, they stick around not just to watch one video, but to actually stick around and watch many others, and our completion rate is pretty consistent, um, where people are, are actually watching like several talks um, you know, that can be anywhere between eight to 18 minutes long. Yeah. You're talking about the TED formula, and I was kind of wondering if you were going to start pacing over here as <laughs> yes. you're giving your remarks, but I don't think the mic would follow No, the, you, mic, so. the mic is awkward. Um, <laughs> and, your, and your tone is thankfully the same as I've always remembered. So, that <laughs> <laughs> so good job there. Right, they haven't um, gotten to me yet. So you mentioned um, completion rate, and I'll, I'll just sort of just share anecdotally also my experience with TED, which is um, not actually been search, uh, but during certain times in my life, whether it's like a subject or something very personal, like when my father had a stroke, someone said, you must see Jill mm. Bolte Taylor's talk on recovery from stroke. And it became almost like everywhere I turned, everyone would, I suddenly found myself a part of this community where the TED talk bound us. Um, and so I just wanna stay with you and to reflect on, like I suddenly felt a part of a community because um, I was referred to content as a way out of kind of a really horrible experience yeah. in, the, yeah. in, the, in that point of my life. Um, so I just wanted you to reflect a little bit on um, the extension of a talk to build that community. Um, and then I'll have a follow-up, I suspect, on, yeah. on this. But, just, yeah. but just, let's just start there. So first of all, the, the main reason that I decided to make the leap from the journal to TED was exactly that. I saw that TED is unique in that it has community. So community to TED can be lots of things. We have a TEDx uh, 
initiative, which is uh, like the franchise arm of TED Talks. Um, there are something like 1,000, before the pandemic, there were 100 events taking place every single day globally around the world. And we're climbing back to that number now. Um, and those are all community-driven um, organizers who put on events themselves. So first of all, you have that community. We have a community of 40,000 volunteer translators who are working very hard to translate all of our talks into, I think it's something like 160 different languages worldwide. Um, and by the way, they're working with AI. It's, they're, we're looking to level up that effort. Um, and sorry, and Carl, are they volunteers? They're or? volunteers, 40,000 okay. volunteers. When I heard this number when I was interviewing, I just, I couldn't even believe that figure. Um, and that has remained steady and actually grew during the pandemic. Um, and then we have TED-Ed. We work with, in partnership with 640,000 teachers worldwide um, to craft different plans um, for teachers in their classrooms. We work with students to help them how to give presentations. Um, so there's like boots on the ground kind of community. Um, when I joined, I really wanted to figure out how to join the digital audience, which is, if you just look at follower count across digital platforms, more than 100 million followers across those platforms, um, I wanted to join that kind of community and what you're describing um, with the in-person community, whether it's those volunteers, whether it's the you know, thousands of people who attend the TED conference. How do you bridge after you've attended an event in person with the digital experience? Um, so we find organically what you're describing, that people feel like they are part of a community because they want to bond with TED and they also want to find like-minded people throughout who are, who are also consuming this content. And so in 2021, my team launched a TED membership and that has been not only a supporter-driven model that is bringing revenue to TED. TED is a nonprofit, which I should have said at the beginning. Um, it's brought in millions of dollars in supporter revenue at this time, and, and that's a wonderful thing, but what's amazing to me is how engaged they are. They, they're they part of virtual events that we put on. They have, just last week, they were able to attend virtually um, the TED conference, and they're constantly in conversation with us. Um, and it's just a, a wonderful way to really get kind of one-to-one -one communication with our audience. Um, the other piece that I just wanted to stay on is when you mentioned completion rates, a big trend of just the last few days has been short form video and TikTok. And um, it feels like you're actually, unless I'm not hearing you all on TikTok, but it feels like it's still very immersive and um, people are not just clicking on one video, but many videos in their experience. So how do you um, attract that engagement and why in this moment when the rest of us are rushing towards reels and, and really like 30 to 90 seconds is, is at least where, where we're at, um, what's the secret? Well, I think the secret is actually we're doing all of it. So, so you, my, are, you, yeah, you are so doing the team, short form yeah, also. Okay. So, um, you should all follow us on TikTok. It's called <laughs> TED Talks, which I think is like the team cracked me up when they came up with that name, TED, T-O-K-S. Um, that has 1.7, thank you, thank you. Um, <laughs> it's uh, 1.7 million followers. Now we reached a million followers in seven months of launching um, the account. My feeling is you have to be thinking about different ways that people want to consume your content. So it could be that you know, 60, 59 second video, which would either be for TikTok or for YouTube Shorts, which is something we're experimenting with as well. It may be that somebody wants to read a transcript of a talk. They don't want to watch video. You know, I heard somebody asking a question in a session earlier about low bandwidth. TED is incredibly global. When I worked at the Wall Street Journal, I thought that the Wall Street Journal was global. When I saw Ted's numbers when I got there, I, I actually thought I was reading something incorrectly. 60% of the audience that consumes Ted content is global, and that's non-English speaking countries. 
Wow. Right. And so we're and ju just for perspective there, like, for example, when I worked at the Atlantic, it was more like 40 percent. So 60 percent right. is quite it's significant. Huge. It's yeah. huge. Yeah. And so we we're constantly thinking, OK, what are the different ways that people want to consume? And so it can be that one minute reel or, or TikTok. It can also be, you know, our audio collective and all of the original podcast content that we have. So we are thinking about how does somebody watch, read, listen to TED and engage there. And when we do that well, it can serve as a discovery mechanism for someone to come and connect with longer form content. Um, I wanted to turn over to Raju to talk a little bit about how you've grown audience since you arrived, and I think you're going to have some visuals for us to look at to show us how you did it. Sure. Right, uh, can thanks. we switch to the... There we go. Yeah. I'll put out some numbers out there. McKinsey usually doesn't talk numbers, but I kind of get away with it. Um, it's a pretty large um, publication uh, operation. Um, uh, we have close to 100 million reads. We call them reads simply because uh, we, are, we are very privacy conscious, so we don't ask for a lot of information mm -hmm. from you. So uh, I know how many articles have been read, but I don't know if one person is reading 100 or it's 100 different people. So we don't want to overemphasize uh, the unique part of it. Uh, so it's a pretty large website. It's grown, as you see. Uh, I joined uh, COVID and I came to McKinsey together. So um, uh, these are the COVID year numbers, and they have not particularly gone down. Um, our website is still it's free. Uh, you can sign up. We have 45 different uh, uh, emails uh, that you can subscribe to. Uh, on the right side is the uh, email subscription growth. Again, it's a pretty large number. Our average uh, subscriber um, signs up between five and ten different emails, so they read a lot of McKinsey emails. Our community uh, is somewhat defined, right? First of all, our universe is defined by business audiences. We are not trying to be anything more than that. Within that, there are two ways of building community. One is around uh, the practices of the like we, what you do, right? You could be in banking, you could be in strategy, you could be in finance, you could be in tech. So that's a vertical uh, community. And the horizontal communities is like your CEO. So we have something for CEOs, no matter what field. So there's both a horizontal and a vertical community. And your as active well. email subscribers, the number there that's kind of approaching the 2 million is mm -hmm. the cumulative of all of these different products, is that? It is. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and so again, just for perspective, because I'm trying to connect this to journalism, uh, when I worked at CNN, one of the largest newsletters in the world is the CNN Five Things newsletter. It tells you everything you need to know every day. That has um, two million subscribers. And so I never actually would have thought that McKinsey cumulatively has as many subscribers as the largest uh, news product on the web. So that's, that's interesting. Yeah, and our opt-out rate, right, I mean, uh, is 0.06%. So once you get somebody to subscribe, they literally have it for their life. We have a different problem because of that. A lot of people, because they may not be in the same company for a long time, they actually subscribe to the Gmail. Mm. So I often don't know what company they are at, um, but uh, we know that email will travel with them for the rest of their lives. So those are the numbers. Um, mm. I think if you put McKinsey Publishing in the top 10 business publications in the world will probably be in there yes. at some point. Uh, it helps that we don't charge uh, for anything. Um, there's a reason why McKinsey is in publishing. Uh, unlike Carla or even Mitra, uh, we are 100% for profit. <laughs> it's McKinsey after all. Actually, um, I'm for profit. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, like, real, I meant like, I'm really for profit, actually. <laughs> I meant like unlike charging for Oh, right, people. right, right. Right, okay. right, right, right. Sorry, you're 100% yeah, you. for profit. <laughs> Um, so that helps, obviously, right? Because you are giving good content away for free. Right? Yes. But the thing that's uh, the reason why we wanted to have this session was not necessarily to talk as much about McKinsey or TED, but to kind of say that a lot of journalists think that when you are outside of news, right, or in business publishing, that it's like the dark side, and that's fine for people to think that. But the lessons learned from how, how do we kind of engage audiences, what are we offering them, 
um, in terms of the value exchange. And my principle is that if you're at the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, if somebody is spending a half hour on a McKinsey publication, that's half hour they're not spending on Wall Street Journal. Right? So if you're at the Wall Street Journal, you should be interested in kind of saying, well, what is it that's working for TED or what is it that's working for McKinsey? So that's kind of what I thought would be useful for that perspective. And in that, in that um, desire for attention, you do think about the Wall Street Journal then as competition for eyeballs? Either of you? Yeah, I mean, for us, anything, our audience is obviously comfortable in English because we mostly publish only in English. They are business audiences, which means they can probably afford to buy all sorts of products and subscriptions. They're curious and they're, you know, educated. That's the audience that reads the Wall Street Journal and the FD. Mm -hmm. And what we are trying to say is not that, that's why it's non-news, right? I publish nothing. There is no news at all. We don't even like relate to any news. So, but the time people spend on this is finite. So being able to kind of figure out a reason why they should spend time with McKinsey on any given day is very critical for us because otherwise I would lose them all to news events. Yeah. Carly, if that's on that competition question. Yeah, I, I mean, I think first of all, everybody is competition at this point. I, I always talk about like my, my dad texting me is competition, right? It's, we're no longer just talking about information. The, the, the web is saturated with information. What, what we are not saturated with is time. So first of all, all brands are publishers now. Go take a look at any of the jobs that they're posting. <laughs> they're all publishing jobs. It's like, it's a fascinating thing to see the amount of corporate spaces that are hiring people to write, to create content, to create podcasts. Um, you know, I, I know somebody who works at Pfizer, for example, and the prime way that they reach their 10,000 employees is through podcasts. Um, and and hmm. like pretty high quality content um, with some journalist or journalistic sounding ground rules where they're not allowed to talk about Pfizer in these podcasts. They're, they're supposed to really just talk about things that are happening in the world. I think that's fascinating. The moment that somebody who's working in a corporate space who has some sort of like business imperative to listen to that podcast, now that is my competition. Right, they're, they're not listening to a TED talk because they wanted to listen to this piece and sound smart in the boardroom. Um, so personal time, uh, TikTok, <laughs> corporate spaces that are, are putting content out there, I think that that is all competition. The other thing is, you know, TED is unique in the world. I always struggle to say who our competitors are. You know, is it, if we're just talking about the conference business, like maybe it's Aspen Ideas or, or, or things of that nature, it's a conference of this nature. Um, if we're talking about video content of talks, it's everyone in the entire world. It's Netflix, it's, um, you know, uh, any, and it's BuzzFeed. I'll throw BuzzFeed, <laughs> you know, they've had a, a tough week this week. Um, you know, so I, I think the old way of thinking, it's just the Wall Street Journal against the New York Times is a very dated way of thinking and we need to kind of open the aperture there. Um, you mentioned BuzzFeed and um, of course the revenue question comes to mind, which is both of you describe a background in journalism where you had, it sounds like a lot of both exposure and experience um, on the revenue side. I just wonder if that is your primary um, measure of success, or are there others um, that you all might be using to gauge whether this is working or not? Either of you can answer that. So for McKinsey Publishing, revenue is like just not a metric at all. The metrics are pretty conventional, right? Which is, um, so I count uh, time spent but I only count time spent if they go through at least 30% of the article. Meaning that if you came, looked at a headline, read the first paragraph and left, I do not count you at all. Because to me, I'm not trying to bring people because I'm not surfacing any ads, I'm not trying to monetize you, right? So for me, a true metric of time spent and engagement is have you first scrolled through a third of the story and then how much time have you spent? So that's what we count. 
so that's a metric. The other metrics are obviously reach. Um, we have we have audiences from 190 countries. Uh, our top five countries only account for 40 percent. Mm -hmm. The other 60 percent come from all over the world. So those are conventional metrics. But sure, I mean McKinsey is in publishing not because you know we are in the news business or we want to like just tell people what's happening. They're they're in publishing because there's value to McKinsey, and the way that value comes is. All of our content is internal. We don't like do any freelance. We don't have third party content. It's all our partners mm -hmm. who have done interesting work and then have, we help them kind of. Do you have a slide showing some of that? I just wondered if that might help people visualize what you're talking about in terms of the breadth of. Yeah, the, the slides I have here are actually more around how do we create engagement and build new products. Okay. Um, but I can. It's just there was a list of products that I thought were kind of there. Yeah. So this is an example yeah. of like, so. Um, three years ago, um, I mean, I've been there a little over three years, one of the gaps in business is that there are lots of business books written, but there's not a lot of like coverage to books anymore, right? Mm -hmm. Most book review sections are not really as robust, hardly anybody talks to the authors, but a lot of people want to read business books. So we created a franchise called, uh, first of all we created a franchise called McKinsey on Books, and we talked to an author of a business book once a week, a new author, right? We ask them five or six questions. Why do you write the book? What's so it's a bit of a summary of the book, and then we hope that people will find it interesting and go buy the book. We created a, a curated uh, a newsletter for people who read books or mm -hmm. leaders, which is our audience. And in like a relatively short time, it's gotten to 200,000 subscribers. Again, it's free, right? Um, we do a lot of videos, but we're tying it back to the revenue question, right? McKinsey also publishes its its own authors write books. You know, these are published by you know HarperCollins and all of that. But now that I have a franchise that has a big audience and a growing audience and a newsletter and a habit, when McKinsey publishes a book, I can leverage all of that. So the first book I published was called CEO Excellence two years ago. As you can see, it's become like a bestseller everywhere. The reason it did was because I was able to then turn this audience and say, hey, we have an interesting book ourselves on CEOs. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how you think of revenue rather than just like pure relationship between a reader and the money. That yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. That's, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm glad you showed this. Thank you. Um, we're going to open it up to questions in like uh, two minutes. I'm just going to um, let Carla answer the metrics question um, and also your measures of um, success in the revenue as yeah. well. So, you know, TED is a mission driven organization. The, the main, you know, if you ask Chris Anderson, who is the head of TED, why does TED exist? It is the democratization of ideas, spreading ideas um, that we deem worth spreading um, through the platform that has been created. Um, with that said, we have very traditional metrics. They're qualitative and quantitative. Reach is certainly a very important measure of success. That's where something like TikTok comes into play. Where, where are we really like thinking about the broadest group that we can bring in and how do we engage with them? That's only good if you then bring in qualitative metrics and, and you're looking at the time spent and, and the actions that people are taking. This year we have two guiding metrics that are incredibly important for us. Those are subscribe and share. So how many people are subscribing? How are we building up that kind of one-to-one -one relationship with our audience? And then what are what are we doing effectively to get them to share and amplify Ted's message? This has become incredibly difficult in a world where social media habits have changed, digital habits have changed. It's hard to track, it's hard to really know if people are actually sharing. Um, but we can see through different signals, either delivered through um, you know, referral traffic or maybe mentions online or, or things of that nature. So we do a lot of social listening to track that. Um, but we really believe that the network effect of, of somebody listening to a talk, watching a talk, and then sharing it with someone is incredibly important. Um, and all of that ladders up to revenue. So um, much in the same way as what Raju is, is describing, but I will say that my team for the first time ever, now we have revenue targets. 
we're, we're actually watching to see if um, different platforms that we're on, maybe it's social media, if that's actually bringing in revenue. Um, for example, LinkedIn. Ted has the, we are the largest publisher on, on LinkedIn. Um, we have the highest follower account. We're number three in, on the platform altogether following Apple and Google. Huh. I mean, it's crazy to me, right? So when we saw those numbers, we said, okay, this is an amazing place where people, um, you know, I have lots of thoughts about LinkedIn, why it is what it is. Um, it's a performative space. People like are on their best behavior when they're on that platform. So it's a, a really nice space for us to be able to have like really deep, interesting conversations, oftentimes related to business, but not necessarily the kinds of things that, that McKinsey might publish. Um, it, it might be like a softer science or, or something like that. Um, so we, we started um, uh, working with LinkedIn Lives. We have several series that run throughout the year, and those are underwritten by sponsors. Those sponsors have nothing to do with the content that we create. They just underwrite the, the series. Um, and that has been a wonderful wave of new funding. The other piece would be membership, like I mentioned, mm -hmm. um, which has brought in several million since its launch. Um, and so we're always looking at like where, where's the connective tissue between the organic content that we're creating, the editorially driven content, um, and how can we support that through different revenue. We're gonna turn it over to you, but quickly, Carla, if someone wants to do a TED talk, oh, what, yeah. how would that work? Is it, is it as simple as simply wanting to do one, or is there, is there more to it? Tell, tell us how There's you a get a more to it. Can you uh, them your email? Yeah, <laughs> please don't email me. Um, no, I, if, if you would like to talk, you can email me. But um, the, so first of all, anybody can apply to, to give a TED Talk. You can either apply for yourself or you can nominate someone. And if you just Google TED Talk, um, uh, application form, it will come up. Um, but I, I would ask you three questions. The first question is, do you have an idea? Like, what is your idea? Is it unique? Is it strong? The second question is actually the most important after that. Why are you the right person to give that talk? How close are you to that topic? We typically don't approve talks that, where somebody comes and says, well, I read this thing in a book once and I think it's really interesting and I wanna talk about that. No, like, are you the scientist who discovered that? Are you working with that audience? Do you have a specific uh, personal connection to this? Um, and then the, the last question is, um, why is this the right time to give that talk? And, and I have to say, those are, very similar questions to some of the work that I did at the journal, where I was working with journalists and asking them, you know, first of all, to, to give me a headline, give me, write me a tweet of your story before we start working on this together. Why are you the right person to report this? Why is that subject, that source, the right person to speak about this? So there, there's something very journalistic to it that I think is, is um, quite compelling. Okay, we're turning it over to you. Questions, and please identify yourself and really try to keep it brief so we can get through as many as possible. Um, we have about 10 minutes, go for it, in the back. Um, hi, I'm Julia, I work at DW, Germany's international broadcaster, and you've both uh, spoken about having a big international audience, and we're always trying to figure out ways to reach people who live in very different parts of the world. Um, how do you think your uh, products are so successful with people everywhere. Is it brand recognition? Is it because you cover universal topics that apply to people all over the place? And where do you think success there lies? Thanks. Uh, for McKinsey, it's a few things. First of all, because they've been doing it for 60 years when nobody else was doing it, there's a recognition of the brand. It is also uh, seen as like a very prestigious kind of business organization, so to be seen reading and talking about what I read something in McKinsey is like a little bit of a batch of like, you know, something. Uh, so we, that plays in as well. Um, but we're not, I mean, look at like 100 million, it's like a pretty small audience compared to who you can reach, right? So it's not like we are as successful in non-English um, countries as we could be. Uh, like in the last couple of years, we've now launched like several monthly newsletters that like 
translate the top five stories of that month in that language, because we are finding that you may be okay operating in English in a business, but you're actually more comfortable uh, with Arabic or with Spanish. Mm -hmm. So that's the audience we are trying to get to, saying that you can read English, but maybe you're more comfortable. So it's still a real work in progress. Most of us have been at organizations where, for example, if you're publishing in English, India is like the second largest market for everything outside the US, right? Very difficult market business-wise. Um, it's a very noisy market. So we spend a lot of time thinking about how do we get more Indian business folks to, to engage with us. And it's an ongoing issue. I don't think any of us can claim to have cracked the code. But the, Ted, I find there's a universality of the topic, mm -hmm. right? If it's about how to deal with cancer, right? That's a problem that anybody on this earth is dealing with. That's right. Yeah, I, I think that universality is incredibly important. I also think the the prestige piece that Reggie was talking about is, is very similar with TED. Um, even if you're not attending a TED conference, which is one level of prestige, just intellectual capital to say, I, I learned about this in a TED talk is, you know, conveys something about your habits. Um, but I, I will go back to the community piece, the, the work that we do with these translators, the work that we do with, um, with our TEDx organizers and TED-Ed, it's tremendous. They help us spread ideas through their communities. When, when a talk lands and it resonates specifically with that community, um, geographically, they're doing a lot of that amplification work. Um, so that's incredibly important and it, it's, it's important to be able to connect the dots on, on how to leverage the work that one initiative is doing with um, the media arm. And that, that's a work in progress. I, I don't want to overstate, you know, we haven't cracked the code on that. Uh, TED is a very complex organization that often is like quite siloed. And so a lot of the work that, that I do is try to identify different opportunities and then connect the dots. Like I think of it as a, a cocktail party I'm very good at a cocktail party if you give me a job, if you say to me, I want you to connect people and make sure that they all know each other. And, and that's kind of how I think of my job. Um, so thank yeah. you. This question over here. Uh, my name is Ankur Paliwal. I'm, I'm a journalist in India and founder of Queer Beat. Uh, it's a publication that publishes stories about LGBTQIA people mm -hmm. and especially doing translations so that these conversations can happen in the regions where they are needed. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is to you, Carla. You talked about uh, doing everything to uh, <laughs> gain audiences, uh, build communities, but for organizations like mine, which are small and serving specific communities, we don't have resources to do everything. Um, so. What advice do you have for me or organizations like us about what strategic decisions we can take to, to do news related or non-news stuff to build communities and maybe turn that into revenue? Uh, I also want to use buzzwords like biggest, highest <laughs> that you guys are <laughs> using, uh, but it's a resources game. Yeah. 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 So, so first of all, um, I, it was a bit of hyperbole to say do everything. <laughs> so, um, but you know, a, a few things. First of all, TED is is not that large of an organization. We're talking 220 people for all of the work that I just described. Um, people often think it's a much larger organization. Um, I would say prioritization is the number one piece. And in order to prioritize, you need to know your audience inside out. So you can't just chase the, the shiny new thing, right? You have to know where your audience is engaging, where they live, where they go, where are their habits, what do they need? Ask them. The, the power of a survey to just directly ask, why, why do you like my publication? What do you need? Like asking those very direct questions are, are the seeds that will give you the seeds that you can plant for that kind of growth. I would much rather see um, an organization like yours and like the organizations that I used to work for really focusing on one area and killing it there. It, I don't care it, to see an organization that's doing a lot of things poorly um, and, and is spread out. Um, 
you don't ne necessarily need to be on TikTok, right? Unless if that's where your audience is. Yeah. Other questions? I think we have time for one or two more, so there's one over here. Oh, go ahead. Hi, uh, I'm Rafiul. I run the Queer Muslim Project. It's, uh, it's one of Asia's leading platform for LGBTQ and Muslim voices. So my question is again for you, Carla. The thing is that, um, you know, given that we work a lot with communities that are at the intersection of faith, sexuality, etc., like oftentimes people are not visible hmm. or it's difficult. They, have, they may have a great idea. So I actually wanted to ask you, what has your experience been, especially with the TED Talks, around bringing to the four people who may have a security issue about being visible but might still have a great idea. Hmm. So how do we create reach for those that are often at the, you know, are left behind actually? So that's yeah, question. yeah. So, so first of all, we, we have a group of curators who are, are constantly looking to seek voices that are underrepresented. So that's the first thing, having somebody who's really dedicated to that. Um, the other piece is being flexible with format. So it doesn't have to be a TED Talk. Right, we, we at one point, uh, for, for budget reasons, we've had to put it on pause, but we had a, a podcast where we actually had anonymous people who were able to share their stories. So specifically for what you're talking about. Um, and we have interview formats for people who might not be comfortable getting on stage and giving a talk. Right, so I, I'm thinking about lots of different identities and also abilities and, and comfort levels. Um, so I think having that flexibility is, is key here. But I, I'd love to talk to you a little bit more about that afterwards. Yeah. I think we have time for one last question. Uh, there's a woman right here. Hi, um, Emma Thomason. Uh, just a question, I'm a journalist, uh, a question around um, sort of formats and how they're changing. Obviously you talked about not everybody has to do TikTok, um, but in terms of TED Talks at least, there was this formula that obviously has been very successful. I'm interested to know, you know, what tweaks you might make to that. And also just the question of, obviously TED Talks are one person who's an expert in their topic, they talk about that you don't have kind of faces that are brands, you know, it's each person for their specialist topic. So how does that relate to a, a media world where, you know, the, the person is the brand? The, mm. the you know, your, your speakers speak on their one topic and then that's the end of their career, sort of TED career. Thanks. Raju, you want to take the formats one first and then mm -hmm. we'll shift to TED? Uh, yeah, just to, it was interesting to hear about like, you know, uh, can't afford to do too many things and what should we focus on? And Carla's response was great, right? Which is, you have to begin by saying, what is the one thing that I do that nobody else is doing? And really double down on that. Um, I'll give an example. So in the world of business now, the topic is generative AI, right? Everybody is talking about chat GPT and all of that. We can't compete with all the news events on there. But as an exercise, when you're done, go to Google and ask the question, Google search, what is generative AI? Just ask that question. The top result you will get anywhere in the world is the McKinsey article. <laughs> and we don't even like publish any news about it, right? So you have to be able to kind of say there's people looking for certain things when they're new and McKinsey is really good about answering that question. That's our strength and I'm not competing for news, but I do it in a way that when the algorithms are looking and serving it up for you, it's the McKinsey article comes because there's a lot of authority there. So I think formats to me are like a way to begin by saying what is the one thing that I'm doing that nobody else is doing. And you can't rely on a lot of journalists that think that if they have good content, they will do well. The problem is for somebody to first know that you have good content, they have to experience it. Mm -hmm. So I have long talked about the fact that good content is table stakes. It's the experience layer that can be still very unique and what is it that you're building that is very different. And if you do that, then you will actually prevail. Yeah, I love what you're saying there. I, I would say that, the, to your question, I would say that the TED Talk is definitely the canon, right? It is the, the foundational piece. And I do think that that's what TED does well. 
Um, but we also understand increasingly that not only do speakers need different ways of communicating, but our audiences need different ways of receiving those messages. And so we work with the different speakers to figure out the best way to convey that. Um, it's actually an interesting relationship. I, I would say of the different communities that I listed, I would also put the speakers in that community. Ted actually makes a commitment to continue working with these speakers after they've given their talk. It's not um, a one and done relationship if the speaker wants that. Um, there are all sorts of ways that we promote their, their books when they come out, that, that we work with them on new ideas, new discoveries, new research that they're doing. Um, there's a, a speaker bureau that Ted launched kind of quietly over the past, during the pandemic, and that's an area where, where we're really looking to support speakers. Um, but I, I think that can only be successful if you're really thinking about what, what does Ted need to be relevant in the world, what do speakers need to get their messages out, and how are we triangulating that with audience needs? We're gonna let that be um, our last word on this. Thank you, Raju, thank you, Carla. This has been really, really a fascinating discussion. So, so grateful for it. Thank you. Thank you.